What will you do when your money works for you? Welcome to the Tech Girl Financial Podcast with your hosts, Victor and Kim Gaxiola. In today's episode, Victor and Kim discuss how insurance is used to protect investors and their families due to an untimely death or disability, and the high cost of long-term care. From the home office in California, here is Victor and Kim. Welcome back to the Tech Girl Financial Podcast with today's episode, What If? Welcome back, Kim. Thanks. It's good to be back. I love that question. What if? What if? It opens so many possibilities. But you can't say it like that. You have to say, what if? And then say something. No, and then pause. Oh, and then take it in. Yeah. Just relax. Because think about all the things that are going through your ho- as in your head when you say, what if? Mm, I can think of a lot. I tend to be very optimistic, as you know. So I think of all the good things that it can happen. Like, yeah, I know. Me too. What if we make some ribs tonight? Mm, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> Focus. Well, we wanted to dedicate, you know, one episode and here we are, uh, tail end of season one. So this will be the final podcast of our first season, which has been a lot of fun doing the podcast. And we're going to pick things up later this summer. I think in the August timeframe, we'll start with season two. We've got a, a lot of exciting programs and episodes planned for season two. So be on the lookout for that. But what do you think, Kim? 10 episodes in, lots of great content. Yes, I want to thank you for bringing this into our world here at Tech Girl Financial because I am having a lot of fun with this. And we're hoping that you're having a lot of fun with this, learning and getting a better understanding of the world that we live in as far as the types of topics that are top of mind with our clients and the people that we work with. So we've covered everything from breaking money silence to financial literacy for the youth. Uh, We talked uh, last week, we were talking about college education planning and the things that you should consider there. And so what we're looking forward to being able to provide in the next season is a little deeper dive, I think, in different subject areas. Right. And things to think about as it relates to estate planning, uh, buying a home Um, when you start thinking about, you know, getting the help of a professional when it comes to a certified public accountant, things to think about when you're filing for your taxes. So there are there is going to be a larger educational component going forward as well. Right. And we will be bringing in a lot more guest speakers. So if you're tired of listening to Kim and Victor, <laughs> we will have some other guests in there that are specialists in all of those different areas that will help us out with um, the calls. Yeah. So we look forward to having a number of different guests coming into the program to share you know, their insights, especially in the areas that they work in. Uh, and as an extension of the professional network that we have and, and make available to our clients. Right. And we always want to provide timely information. So if there is something going on out there that you think we should be talking about, um, ask, hashtag ask TGF. And um, we would love to hear your input. Or you can also just send me an email at uh, victor at techgirlfinancial.com. We are very interested in seeing if there's any specific topic areas that you'd like us to cover or special guests. Or if you want to be on the program, let me know too. You know, we're always welcome to have guests on the show. We just set up the microphones and have a good time. Right. So, Kim, what are we talking about today? Well, going back to what if, I want to talk about the five what ifs that uh, need to be talked about. And you need to have answers to all these what ifs. And so, um, you know, these are the what ifs that we help our clients with day in and day out. And so... um, there's both, you know, the what if I live a long life, which is the optimistic one. We're going to live a long life. And so we're going to need to make sure we save enough money for that long life. But mm-hmm. that one we're not going to cover today. That's just a, what if I live a long life? Do I have enough assets to cover me? And there's a whole slew of other stuff that goes there. But that's for a retirement planning mm-hmm. session. Um, not today. So we're going to talk about some other more serious what ifs. And that is one, what if I have an accident and I can't work tomorrow? Mm. Will I still be able to live the life of luxury I live today? (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe it's not a life of luxury. Maybe it's just, you know, kind of middle of the road. Um, We need to make sure that we have enough to cover us in that event. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you I'm glad you think we live a life of luxury. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yes, we have meat once a week, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so the other question is, you know, more serious, Mm -hmm. um, actually, even more serious is what happens if I don't wake up tomorrow? Mm. 
Very sad. Yeah, I know. I And I think that I'd that's be the best way to say it because mm-hmm. nobody wants to think what happens if I die tomorrow. Yeah. But what happens if I don't wake up tomorrow? Mm-hmm. And when we think about that, we have to say, you know, okay, forget me personally. If I don't wake up tomorrow, I just want to make sure that you and the kids are okay. Mm-hmm. And so... Obviously, mentally and emotionally, you'll all be devastated without me. Oh, for sure. But you do not need to be financially devastated. No, no. And thank, thank you for that, for setting us up that way. Yeah, so that's what we need to look at. Um, so that's the other question there. Uh, there's also the, you know, again, we won't explore this one as much, but what happens if I have a medical catastrophe that's more on the health side? Mm-hmm. Understand your health insurance and how much you have to set aside for that max out of pocket catastrophe. So if that happens, you um, don't have problems with your your finances because a lot of times that can set families back. Mm-hmm. Um, but also with that question, then we go into the whole idea of what happens if I live a long life and it's so long I can't take care of myself. Right, right. You can't you can't bathe yourself. You have trouble walking. So a number of different things that make it very difficult. I mean, so it's kind of like double-edged sword. Like on the good news is you live a long life, right? You're still around. Bad news is you're not as youthful as you used to be. So you can't get around and you can't do the things that you normally can do when you're much younger. Right, right. So if you are in the sandwich generation there, um, that is the people that are looking after their kids and their older aging parents, listen up. This will be really informative and helpful for you, I think. Right. Well, and I think that, you know, a lot of these obviously start thinking about have to do with the what ifs of how do you prepare not only yourself, but more importantly, how you prepare your loved ones. And I don't think I think that it's a subject that's difficult sometimes for people to to have or to talk about just because it shows, you know, it, it brings to light your own mortality. No one likes to think about the fact that they're going to die. And yet we're all going to die. You know, spoiler alert, everybody's going to die and death and taxes. Right. So it's mm-hmm. the, the two truisms of life. Right. And so um, that is something to prepare for. Also, once you start getting into the larger number of assets, fortunately, nowadays, estate planning taxes, um, you know, on the on the tax side is not really a big issue unless you have, you know, over $10 million in assets. You're not going to worry about that right now. Um, However, it's still important to make sure that your wishes for the next generation are kept. And, um, you know, people laugh at me, but I tell people you can control your money even after you're gone. Mm -hmm. Sure. (laughs) So the way you do that is to make sure you have the proper estate planning documents in place. Mm -hmm. Estate planning. uh, So you're talking at a baseline here and having the estate planning Right. I think I think in a previous podcast, we even talked about even further than that, just having that emergency fund when we talk about cash flow Mm -hmm. and just having some cash on hand in case something happens that you can access. So that's that would be like a very simplistic, fundamental way to protect yourself. Right. Which is self-funded. Right. Right. Because you have to save the money to have in case you have an accident or information or some sort of an emergency that you can pull from. Mm -hmm. Right. What you're talking about now is, okay. let's move that a little bit forward. If you should happen to pass away, now you want to protect your assets and be able to control exactly how those assets are going to be utilized by the next generation or the people that you've actually entrusted with these assets. And you can establish that through a trust. Um, what else? What else should people be thinking about from a baseline perspective? So from that baseline perspe- perspective, um, you know, even healthcare directives and power of attorney. There, so there's a staggering statistic out there, actually a couple of them. And I mean, I'm just Google searching this um, for all of you that are curious about these stats. But above the age of 65... Um, a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease doubles roughly every 65 years. And what does that mean? That, um, you know, if you're over 65, one in 14 people over the age of 65 are going to be in, impacted by some sort of dementia and one in six over 80. Wow. That. It is staggering. I mean, when you start looking at the stats and such, we're going to scare you with a lot of statistics (laughs) throughout this podcast because it is, 
you know, it is kind of an eye opener. And I go back to the fact that people aren't thinking about these things because I think the tendency is for most of us to think that we're invincible and it's not going to happen to me. Right. And, right. and so it's really important going back. I, I think I was so excited to tell that statistic because I think it's important for people to know that. Mm -hmm. Um, But where I was really going with that is to say, you know, at some point in time, if we live a long life, we are going to be mentally slowing down. And so we do need our family members in our lives to help us. We need a plan to execute when that time comes so that, um, you know, the next generation can help us take care of the money, and make sure that as we age, we get the right care. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go into a little bit more uh, detail. Let's get a little deeper here because what we're really talking about, and it's not an exciting way of thinking, but it's really protection planning. It's planning to protect yourself, planning to protect your family. And let's start with the one that I think most people are familiar with, Kim, and that's life insurance. So life insurance, I think, is something that's easy to understand. Right. It's you put a policy, you get a policy to protect yourself, your assets. More importantly, if something should happen to you, that there's going to be an amount of money that would be passed on to your family. Right. So from the the purest form of of protection. And yet, based on a LIMRA study, about 60 percent of all people in the United States were covered, fortunately, with some kind of life insurance in 2018. However, according to that same study, they're finding that among those with life insurance, about one in five will say that they don't have enough. That, you know, Maybe they're just getting it through their employer. They're getting a life insurance policy, but not enough to really cover what typically people do is they're trying to cover you know, for dependent care, try to cover for college education for their dependents, or a mortgage. I think that that's the biggest thing. You know, So you and I have an insurance policy that helps us with all three of those things. Uh, should something happen to you? Should something happen to me? You can rest assured that, yes, we're devastated, as you said. We'd be devastated. But there is some, there's a great deal of comfort knowing I don't have to worry about the next mortgage payment or the next, you know, or being able to cover the mortgage or get the kids through college as a result of you. Because not only would you passing away be devastating, but that also means that there's no more income. Right. From and you, that's you know? the key thing. I yeah. think if you want to keep this in the most simple form, it's you are protecting yourself from a loss of income. Mm-hmm. And so um, if you are in a double income household, then you need to protect both um, both spouses income. And even if one spouse chooses to stay home and um, take care of the kids, there is an, a value in, in what you do as well. And so a lot of times the, the spouse that is at home with the kids may not have life insurance thinking, you know, they don't bring in an income, but it would take a lot of money to get a caregiver like you, and obviously no one is going to be like you, but it would take a lot of money to get a caregiver to give the kind of care that you give to those kids. And certainly if you were to pass away, you'd still want them to be cared for in that same capacity. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important. And I think something that is is kind of over overlooked a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that there's two impediments based on the statistics as well as to what keeps people from actually pursuing getting a life insurance policy. And the term policy is real simple. You know, you buy it for 20 years, you you go in, you, you have a certain stated amount that you're looking to receive in case of death, an untimely death. There's a specific term for it. And then you're making, you know, monthly premium payments or you can do them quarterly or annually. But consumers have a tendency of overestimating the cost of insurance, especially younger generations. They find that 44% of millennials overestimate the cost at five times the actual amount. So that's one impediment, thinking it's going to be really expensive, Mm -hmm. which it doesn't have to be. Uh, And then the second thing is that over half of all consumers say that they're more likely to purchase life insurance if it was priced without a physical examination. So that's the other thing. People are concerned about their own health Mm -hmm. and their rating, you know, to get a favorable rating as it relates to uh, life insurance. But the thing is this, and this is true, the younger you get it, the better, right? Right. Because you're usually in healthier, the the, the premiums will be a lot lower. So it's, it reminds me of the old adage. It says, when's the best time to plant a tree, right? It was 20 years ago or today. So you don't hesitate. If you don't have life insurance to protect your family for covering the mortgage, for the the income that won't be coming in as a result of an untimely death, 
it's the simplest of insurance you should at least pursue. Right. And remember, you probably do have something at work, but it may not be enough. Chances are it is not enough. Um, So look into that and have a policy on the side because even if you do have enough insurance by work, if you change jobs or get let go, you run out of that policy. And, um, you know, that may be a time in your life when things are more stressful and you just want to make sure you're covered throughout your lifetime, whether you're Mm -hmm. employed or not. Right. Well, in talking about employment and talking about, you know, the possibility of not having income, disability, you know, disability, the, the, the statistics showing that you're more likely to be disabled, right, mm-hmm. are staggering. So let's move to dis- disability insurance. Right. So, I mean, chances are you are more likely to have a disability that um, creates an impact on how you do your job and, and get receive income. And so you just want to make sure that, again, going back to our life of luxury or whatever it is, <laughs> we have income. If I can't work tomorrow, how will, how will we live mm-hmm. if I'm not bringing in an income? And so that's where the disability insurance comes in. Again, you probably have one at work. Um, is it enough or not? You have to look at your expenses to see if that would cover everything or not. Yeah. Here here we go with some scary stats again. So this is from soundfinancialplan.com. They said that someone who is 35 years old has a 50% chance of disability for 90 days or more before they turn 65. So one in two. That, wow. that, that, I, that one shocked me, actually. Well, you know what's interesting about that, too, is that, okay, so we do a lot of retirement planning, and people tell me they want to stop working at 60 or 65 or whatever that age is. That's great if they can go to 60 or 65, but sometimes, and I see this often, is that your body can't keep up. You may have some, you know, if you have diabetes or if you have some sort of a, condition that makes it more difficult for you to do your job, then you may have to stop working earlier and go on disability. And that may be 50 or 55, whatever it is. um, You're really appreciative if you have that policy to bridge the gap between when you can no longer work and your retirement. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely, you know, and unfortunately, according to these very same statistics, about 110 million Americans do not have any sort of long-term disability insurance. And most people in the United States are actually better prepared in case of death with life insurance, as we just discussed, than if they get disabled, even though the chances, and this is I think this is where we're going, is they're at least three to five times greater of being disabled depending on their age. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it's just one of those things that I think, for some reason, I think people think of insurance, they think life insurance term, and that's about it. But the the... the you know, the probability of being disabled is is really, you know, bigger Even than greater. I think most people think about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's also what you what what may you need if you become disabled? Like if you can no longer walk and you're wheelchair bound, how do you prep your house for that? Oh right. And that's an expense right. too. And so there's more than just the living expenses. There's an add on cost of whatever you may have to take on for your medical needs. Mm -hmm. So the last form I think of insurance, or at least something to keep in mind, and you've already mentioned it a little bit, is this long-term care. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, because of the baby boomer generation being such a large generation, that we're seeing more and more talk and buzz and people, you know, approaching the the, the conversation around long-term care. So can you share a little bit about, you know, what is long-term entail? And then we'll do a couple of true and false, okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so the the way it is right now is so much better than what it used to be. And the plans have really improved. So a lot of people I've talked to over the years have said, oh, I can't afford long-term care insurance. It's so expensive. But now what we see is a lot of hybrid policies It's a life insurance policy with a long-term care benefit rider. Mm -hmm. And what I like about these is long-term care insurance is like car insurance. Mm -hmm. If you don't get in an accident, you don't use it, and it's a lot of money to pay for a question mark. 
However, if you buy a life insurance policy with a writer that will cover you for long-term care if you need it, well, you know you are going to die eventually. And so this policy will be used for one or the other. And so what the writers do is they speed up the death benefit. So if you had a $500,000 life insurance policy and um, with a long-term care benefit writer, perhaps you can get that death benefit earlier to cover you in long-term care. Now, I'm simplifying this. And I'm sure there's a lot, I know there's a lot of details in this uh, and they can get complicated. So make sure, you know, you understand all that if that's something that you're interested in. But um, to summarize it, there, there are these plans that, you know, have more certainty, 100% certainty you'll use this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. It's, it's almost like when you buy a, a fire extinguisher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you buy it to protect yourself in case there is a fire. You're hoping you never use it. And it's one of the few times when you buy something you hope you never have to use. Right. Right. <laughs> and the same thing with insurance in many cases. But this one, this particular one is something that you are likely to use. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's much more valuable. Okay, so let's uh, let's test everybody now, Kim. This will be the, the game show component of the podcast. It's, the question is, how much do you really know about long-term care? And this is where we're going to separate the elder care facts from the elder care myths. So I'll give you three. Okay, um, so I'll ask the question, and then you answer it in your head, Kim, and then I'll see if, if you've got the answer. Okay, so the first one: true or false? About forty percent of today's sixty-five-year-olds will eventually need long-term care. So think about: it. is it true, or is that fault? False. Forty percent of today's sixty-five-year-olds will eventually need long-term care. All right. It's it's that's right, Kim. That's, you know, one for one. Right. It's false. So the Department of Health and Human Services estimates that close to 70 percent, not 40, 70 percent will about a third of 65 year olds may never need such care. But one fifth are projected to require it for at least five years. The flip side of living a longer life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So if you're keeping score, Mm -hmm. that one was false. All right, next question. True or false? A semi private room in a nursing home costs about $35,000 a year. So is that true or is that false? Okay, this one I know by experience. It's false. That's right, Kim. Because I can tell you that the bills my clients are telling me they're paying or their parents are paying are a lot higher than that. That's, you are, again, you're two for two. So according to Genworth yes. Financials, most recent cost of care survey, the median cost is now $85,775. A semi-private room in an assisted living facility has a medium annual cost of about $45,000 annually. A home health aid, how much do you think that is? A home health aid. It's about $50,000 yearly. Mm -hmm. Um, And even if you just need someone to help, you know, with eating, bathing, or getting dressed, the median hourly expense is not cheap at all. Non-medical home aides, according to Genworth, from about $20 per hour, which is at 10 hours a week, nearly $11,000 a year. So not cheap at all. Right. And you do need that care. I mean, even, you know, I see families where the one spouse needs help and the other spouse is a caretaker, but that can be so um, tiresome for the spouse that's the caretaker. And so I encourage you know, those clients that are in a position to really think about this and hire that home health caretaker because it will start wearing at your health too if you are the primary caregiver. Yeah, and then speaking of experience, I mean, we've seen people who have exhausted, you know, the retirement Mm -hmm. savings as a result of not having either long-term care based on the high cost of health care. Right. General, right. Right. And there's some options. So it's just something you need to plan with your advisors. Um, there's a lot of ways to go about that here in California. We have healthy home balances. And so that is an option, too, is to maybe draw from that equity. Uh, but if you don't have that option or you live somewhere where um, real estate is not as big of an asset as it is here, mm-hmm. then you, you know, you should be protected All right, so the final true or false question. True or false, the earlier you buy long-term care insurance, the less expensive it is. 
Ah, you make that so easy. True. That is Kim. (laughs) You're blinking 10. That's three for three. True. As with life insurance, the younger policyholders will pay a lower premium and premiums um, premiums climb notably for those who wait until their mid 60s to buy coverage. So here is a situation where, yes, you do benefit much like term insurance to buy it when you're younger. Right. And there and and the benefit of that also is if you can buy it younger because you have some discretionary income, you may not even need to pay it for a lifetime because we can we can figure out a policy where, you know, you don't have to pay for it after you retire mm-hmm. when you need to worry about your income more. So lots of things to do, but you have the greatest flexibility the younger you are. So this is a situation where it's almost a liability to live a long life. Right. (laughs) But I think one of the other considerations, too, is looking at family history for health. Right. So if your family suffers from specific ailments, I think it's something to also consider. Yeah. And this goes back to the dialogues that you want to be having with your family about wishes. What do you want Um, in the earlier years when you're more independent? Perhaps you can do more living at home and having somebody look after you. Um, but over time, perhaps you get lonely and maybe you do want to be somewhere where there are other people like you that you can have a social life with. I think that's so important. And now a lot of these facilities go from independent all the way into, you know, uh, um, Alzheimer's and dementia care. And so you have the full gamut there. So you could be around, you know, your, your friends while you're independent and then, you know, if you have to take the next level of care, you're, you're there, but you're with people that you have established relationships with. Mm-hmm. So today's episode was really focused on, you know, that there are strategies that you can take to protect yourself, protect your family, to answer the what if questions and just to feel peace of mind, right? So you can sleep at night feeling much more comfortable that should something happen to you, whether you die or not wake up the next day, or if you get disabled and you can't provide that income, that there are ways that you can protect yourself. Right. And I encourage you from the standpoint also of thinking about this in terms of your children and to say that by the time I need long-term care or need to go into a facility, I really don't want to be a burden on my kids. Mm -hmm. And I figure my kids will be somewhere in their middle ages paying for kids going to college and all the other expenses that come along with it, that I want to be able to pay for myself so that when my kids are probably at their peak stressful family years, they are not having to make, um, to, to make sacrifices for their own children Mm -hmm. because I haven't prepared myself. Right. Right. So I know we just scratched the surface and in introducing and talking about, you know, life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care strategies and such. So if you're interested in wanting to learn more, uh, we encourage you to reach out to us, you know, contact us either through our web page, send me an email at victor at techgirlfinancial.com. One thing that we do offer is these insurance reviews, right? To take a look mm-hmm. at what you might be holding or what you might be needing, depending on your specific situation. Right. And I just encourage you all to think about your own family situations. I'm sure we all know somebody that's lived past 100. And, you know, what were their needs when they started um, facing the 90s, late 90s or 100? And um, think about how how it impacted your own family so that when you think of yourself getting up there in years, you want to make sure that your family members are protected as well. Yeah. And I would add the other thing, and you had already mentioned some of this before, is that as, you know, the baby boomer gets a little bit older, followed by, you know, Gen X and the, the, the millennial generations, what we're seeing is that a lot of the insurance companies are coming up with very innovative types of policies and approaches and different strategies to help, right, kind of address people's main concerns. Right. And and we haven't even touched on this. This should have been a true or false question. But, but the idea that Medicare and Medicaid will provide for that level of insurance is false, really. Um, So, you know, it's a good idea to understand what insurance Medicare and Medicaid provide when you're looking at your assets and drawing down and all of that kind of stuff. You really have to understand that. um, And this is where also experts, attorneys in that capacity can help you out as well. 
That is correct. So we will attach uh, the the full true and false. And that's actually one of the questions that comes up on how much do you really know about long-term care as part of the show notes. You can find that as a link in the show notes as well as the blog post that accompanies this podcast. Right. And if you're young, we do have a financial foundation uh, worksheet that will cover the five questions you need to be able to answer in order to make sure that your foundation is rock solid as well. So with that, that concludes episode 10, and it concludes uh, the whole first season of our podcast. We want to thank you so much for listening. And as always, as we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, or ideas for future shows, please reach out to us on Twitter. You can use hashtag AskTGF. Um, You can also send me an email at victor at techgirlfinancial.com. And then the last thing I'll say is we do now have an Instagram account, right? So you can find us on Insta at uh, at Tech Girl Financial. Uh, We're going to be posting daily images, photos, and include some links to other great content. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for listening in this season. Yeah. We hope everybody has a great summer and we'll catch up with you probably in August. So enjoy your summer. Bye. Bye. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future shows, please send an email to victor at techgirlfinancial.com or join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AskTGF. We also encourage you to follow us on the Tech Girl Financial page on Facebook and connect with us on LinkedIn. Securities offered through registered representatives of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., broker-dealer member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, a registered investment advisor. TechGirl Financial and Cambridge Investment Research Inc. are not affiliated companies.